Hey you guys, welcome to the video. I hope you guys are doing well today. So I wanted to make a video kind of following up to an old video I made regarding stop orders on Trader Workstation. Um, so in this video, I want to go into detail and show you a few um, interesting ways that you can manage your stop orders. So this video will probably help you if you're unsure about how to configure your stop orders in Trader Workstation. And actually there's a number of ways that you can use IB's systems to your advantage um, so that you get the right fills on your orders and you don't get filled at unfair prices. So IB has a pretty advanced technology available to retail traders that anybody can use. This video will be all about stop orders. If you enjoy this type of content, leave a like on the video. All right, let's get to it then. First thing I wanna just talk about briefly is the difference between a stop order and a stop limit order. So you might already know this, but I will say it anyways, just to clear it up for those who don't. So if you put a sell stop, basically what's going to happen is when the market trades at that price, it's going to trigger a sell market order. So in this case, when the market trades down at 324.65, it's going to trigger a sell market order, basically meaning you want to sell those shares immediately, hit the bid and sell that position immediately. <clears throat> the difference between a stop and a stop limit is that on a stop limit, you're actually setting a cap for the maximum price you will accept as a fill and the risk with that is of course that you don't get filled at all if the market moves very fast away from your limit. Just to demonstrate, I'll click on this book trader and you will see the order pop up. So I've placed the stop limit down at this price, 325.53. And if you look right here, you're going to see the stop price is 0.53 and the limit price is 0.51 in this case, because I've configured it to be two cents away. So what this order essentially means is that if the market trades down to 325.53, it's going to trigger a sell limit order at 325.51 and in that instance, if the market is trading above 325.51, I will essentially sell at the best price available between those two cents. I'm basically telling the broker that that is the lowest price I will accept on this sell order. Now, of course, the risk with this is that if your stop and your limit are too close, if the spread between the bid and the offer widens up all of a sudden and the market is one directional, there's a chance that your order misses the fill and then you're stuck in the position. So that's why it's very important that if you use a stop limit order, you need to be very conscious of the average spread between the bid and the offer on your market. And basically you do not want to be putting those too close together if you're trading a spready market, that is. For example, if the market came down, hit the stop, and then the market collapsed in one shot and there were no bids all the way down to 325.45, Basically, I would have a limit order in at 325.51 to sell this position, but it would not get filled until somebody buys my offer. You need to understand that very clearly if you're going to be using a stop limit order. Okay, An easy way to determine what your offset should be between your stop price and your limit price is simply to look at the average spread of your market between the bid and the offer. So in this case, we're looking at NASDAQ. You can see on the triple Qs, it's about two cents wide, but there are times when it widens up when the volatility increases. So if you look at a higher price stock like Amazon, for example, you can see very clearly that the spread between the bid and the offer is much larger. In this case, if you use the stop order, you would probably experience some slippage for a market that is more spready like this. You would probably want to use a stop limit. You need to play with that offset between the stop price and the limit price to figure out what is an optimal amount for your market that you're trading. In the case of emergency, it might actually be helpful to have a button configured on your keyboard that can get you out of the market immediately in the case of emergency. And of course you will pay the spread if you do something like that. And on stocks, you'll pay a lot more than on a futures contract, but that's just how the game works. So that's the difference between stop and stop limit. Depending on what it is you're doing and what markets you're trading, there are certain times where the stop is better than the stop limit. And there are other times where the stop limit is better than the stop. So I'll try and give you some examples of that. So let's say you're trading on NASDAQ. On the futures, for example, you can get away with using a plain stop. And again, it will depend on your broker. So I use AMP futures with a CQG connection on stop orders with that broker. During real time hours, I never normally get more than a one tick slippage on NASDAQ. And you guys probably know how volatile NASDAQ is. Now, if you did the same trade with a different broker, you might get more slippage on a regular stop order. So you would have to try that yourself. So if you're scalping on futures, 
a regular stop is generally fine. So now here's an example where a stop limit might come in handy. If you have to protect the positional trade on a stock with a potentially wide bid and ask spread, okay, that's kind of where you need to use a limit because in the case of an emergency, you get taken out and you get forced to sell the bid. In reality, if your stop gets hit, you should probably look to work a limit if the conditions allow that. An example now, let's say I was long 500 shares of this stock and I wanted to place an order in the market to protect my position. So let's say hypothetically, my average price on this trade is 260. And I say that if the price trades back to 260, I want to trigger a stop order to work a limit at the lowest price of 258. This is going to be an example of using a stop limit order. So let me show you how you can figure this right now. On the screen, you can see this is a quote monitor and I have these two parameters set up right here. One of them is the limit price. The other one is the stop price or auxiliary price. When you use a stop limit order, you need to fill in both of these values. So the stop price is the price that will trigger the order to activate and Obviously, the second step to that is configuring the trigger method because there are different methods you can use for the stop to be triggered. And we will talk about that later in the video. So don't forget to stick around. Leave a like on the video if you made it this far. So like I just finished saying, I'm long on the stock, 500 shares. I want to protect my position at a price of 260. So I say if the stock trades at 260, I want to get out. And the lowest price that I will accept is 250. Seven. I'm allowing a three cent slippage on that stop. So now before we send this order to the market, I want to show you something very important regarding stop orders, and that is the trigger method. And you will probably need to do a bit of reading on this yourself. So what you do is you right click on the order to start, then you go to modify, then you click on the order ticket. Now in this menu, you can see all of the parameters that I was able to just configure in the quote monitor right there. But one important thing about stop orders, like I just finished saying, it's the trigger method for triggering stop orders. This setting applies only to stop variant orders simulated by IB on its books before order is submitted to the exchange. Default trigger method for stop orders can differ depending on the type of product. You should definitely click here to learn more. And I'll also provide the link for that in the description. So basically, there's a few different options you have as to how you want this stop to trigger. And I'll give an example first. If you set it to last, basically, if the last price was your stop price, then it will trigger the stop. Now, if you set it to double last, then it's something like you need two consecutive last price values to be at the stop price or below. This is in the case of a sell stop order and then it will trigger the stop. You can also do things like bid ask. So if you set it to bid ask, uh, in the case of a sell order, your stop price needs to be on the ask. When your stop price is on the ask, it will trigger the stop order. You can also set it to double bid ask. So in that case, you would need two consecutive ask values to be your stop price or lower for a sell order. All of this is for a sell order. So two consecutive ask values at your stop price or lower that will trigger the stop. Okay, so this trigger method is actually going to be one of the most important things. This is how the trade is going to behave basically. So I've set a stop at 260. So in order for this stop to trigger, what needs to happen is 260 needs to be on the ask, not on the bid, which means that in order for 260 to be on the ask, the bid is probably going to be 255 to 250, depending on how spready the stock is. And again, you need to be able to identify depending on the market you're trading. So based on the market that I'm looking at, I think that this is a suitable way to place a stop. So if 260 is on the offer, I'll trigger my stop order. But if 260 is on the bid, the stop will not be triggered. Do you guys follow? Definitely you wanna be conscious of the trigger method when you place a stop order. So now you just transmit it. So now the order is active in the market and it will only trigger if 260 is on the offer. So that would be an example of how to configure a stop order to protect a positional trade. Now let's give a couple examples using a book trader real quick. So let's say I click on this book trader and I want to get in on the market. So this is an example of using the book trader to easily manage trades. So in the case of this trade right here, I'm actually in a short position and now I'm out of it filled on that bid. So let's say, for example, I wanted to get into a short position again. 
and let's see if I get filled on that offer. But what a shorter term trader would normally do is attach a stop as soon as they're in the trade. In this case, there's no stop attached, but let's say I wanted to attach one. I can attach one on the book trader by using a configured button. So now what I've configured right here is a buy stop. So if the market trades up to this price, 325.97, it will trigger a buy stop with a limit at 99. So a two cent breathing room there. So watch as the market trades up here. It has not triggered the stop yet. And it triggered the stop at 97. So I bought at 97. The limit was at 99, meaning that would have been the worst possible fill I would have been willing to accept. But I managed to get 97 anyways. So that's sort of how you would use the price ladder to place stops. Okay, so let's do one more example potentially. So let's say I joined the bid right here. Let's say I want to get fill on the offer. Let's see if I can get quickly. And at the same time, I'll put a stop down here just in the case of an emergency. This is just purely an example. I'm not showing you how to trade or this is not a recommendation on how to trade. So as you can see right here, I'm long on 200 shares. I've got two offers there to potentially close the position and they have just been filled and my stop orders are still here and they were not canceled because these orders were not attached. So I'll cancel them on my own. The platform I use the most is called Day Trader. On that platform, there's an interesting feature that cancels all orders when your position is closed. That's actually probably one of the most convenient things for a shorter term trader, because like you just saw right there, when my order would have filled, those two stop orders would have been canceled automatically. In this case, in order to do that in TWS, you need to link the orders with an OCA group. All right, guys, so let's talk about trailing stops really quick before the end of the video. The thing about trailing stops is that you can actually configure a stop to trail automatically. I'm not gonna show you how to trail a stop automatically simply because I think it's way more effective to be discretionary in trailing your stop. From my experience, when you learn how to read the market, it essentially tells you when to trail your stop and when not to, okay? So the idea of having the machine trail it for you at any moment, it's arbitrary when you think of it in, in the context of whatever the market is doing. So if I have a stop order in the market, on a book trader like this, you can essentially move the order just by dragging it around like that, okay? So let's say hypothetically I was long down here at 77 and now I wanted to trail my stop. All you would need to do is drag that order up or down and you can essentially do the same with a limit order as well. And that's pretty convenient for TWS to be able to do that. So in regards to trailing stops, it is really that simple. So let's say you have your stop right there. Everything is configured the way you want it. You simply drag it up. That's all you need to do in order to trail the stop. Now, if you didn't use a book trader like that, the only other way to trail your stop manually would be by changing the values in the order itself. So let's say you had a stop at 324.89 and you now wanted to move it up to 325.05. You just go ahead and change the value and then resubmit the order as a new order. So, all right, guys, so that's going to conclude today's video. I hope you learned something today and I wish you guys all the best. Take care.